Hi, let's begin. Um, my name is Daryl Press. I am the coordinator of the Dickey Center's War and Peace Studies Program. Uh, thank you guys for braving the uh, cold and slushy uh, January here in Hanover to come out to what's going to be a very interesting talk. As I think probably everybody in this room knows, the talk tonight is part of our year-long Rise of China series. So throughout this, throughout this academic year, which started last quarter, we've been hosting a series of talks that look at different aspects of the, the issue which we've called the Rise of China. Um, toward the end of last term, toward the end of the, I think it was the end of November, we had John Mearsheimer out here, and John Mearsheimer um, gave an a, a energetic and controversial talk explaining why, in his view, China's economic rise will likely trigger um, a great deal of instability in East Asia, a great deal, a deal of rivalry, and probably a substantial amount of conflict or at least tension between China and the United States. So that was to set the stage for this, for this um, lecture series. This term, what we're going to do, is we're going to have three different talks that focus more on the details of what's going on now in China. What are the domestic forces that are shaping China and what China will be in the 21st century and which will affect China's role in the world today? We'll look at the economic forces and the economic reforms in China. We'll look at the political forces. And we'll look at some of the demographic tensions in China as well. And then finally, in the spring term, what we're going to do is we're going to have a presentation on China's foreign policy. So if we started out with kind of the big picture about how the balance of power is changing and the trouble that may or may not cause, three lectures on what's going on inside China, then what does China appear to be trying to do in the world, China's foreign policy? And very last, we'll end with a, a panel discussion on U.S. foreign policy options. So that's where we're going. That's the, that's the plan for the series. Tonight, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Professor Ed Steinfeld um, talk to us. Uh, professor Steinfeld is a professor in the political science department at MIT. Uh, he received his bachelor's and his PhD from a little-known university called Harvard University, um, a little bit south of here. You may have heard of it. Um, he is currently the director of the MIT China program and co-director of MIT's China Energy program, or China Energy Group, I should say. And his research for many, many years has been on um, different aspects of China's market transition. So questions such as, you know, how is it that state-owned or how is China managing this transition from state-owned enterprises into competitive market-driven enterprises? Um, and now specifically China's energy sector. Um, how is their energy sector, you know, growing quickly enough to, to deal with its, you know, tremendous new energy consumption? Um, what are the pitfalls there and what are the difficulties in the trans transitions that they're doing? Today, um, Professor Steinfeld is going to talk about uh, China's economic transition and, uh, and uh, the title of the talk as you can see, is playing our game. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Ed Steinfeld. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Daryl. Can you all hear me? All right, great. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and an honor. Uh, it's great to visit Dartmouth. I had a, a great lunch today with uh, students, and uh, they're very exciting. I had a wonderful run outside. The environment's beautiful, so it really has been has been uh, a, a great day. What I'd like to do today is provide a, a little bit of an overview of China's economic transition. And um, within that overview, I'd like to present a little bit of an argument, even. And let me just start. We're, this isn't going to be too slide intensive. But let me just show you a few slides uh, describing China's overall growth picture and talk a little bit about some common American, although I hesitate to overgeneralize, but some common American perceptions of what this growth story is fundamentally about. And then I'll talk about some common Chinese perceptions about what this growth story is all about and what it's not all about. And maybe more important than the data slides is this slide itself of Shanghai today. I mean, how many of you have been to, to China? Been to, okay, so a, a number of you. It is extraordinary for me to, to, to see the kind of growth, the change in the physical sort of shape and size and aspects of this city that I first visited when I was living in uh, Nanjing back in 1988. Things have happened in that city in Shanghai, and things have happened all over China that, um, it's almost cliched to say this, but it's true, uh, things I never would have imagined seeing in my own lifetime, or even in my children's lifetime, have happened in the span of 20 years. Now, moving on to a much drier depiction of this transition, we see the kind of growth curve that's taken place in China. Of course, while this is an extraordinary story, if you were to transpose this 
really to the 1960s and 70s and put the Taiwan there, ch change the scale a little bit, but put Taiwan there, um, you'd have a similar kind of curve and earlier, if you put or South Korea at that time also, earlier Japan. So this curve is not unheard of in East Asia, but that it could have happened in a continental size economy, mainland China, and one that was undergoing not just a period of growth, but a transition from socialism really is quite incredible. I think for, for many Americans, this, um, this kind of growth curve resonates, but this kind of curve also resonates. What this describes is the growing Chinese trade surplus with the United States, a surplus that really began to take off in around 2004 and has continued to grow today. So this slide, taken together with this slide, I think for most Americans, although there's, there are many differences in, within uh, different American communities about uh, how China's interpreted, I think for many Americans, there's something at once awesome about China's growth and its arrival on the global stage. There's something awesome about the Olympics and the opening ceremony. There's something somewhat um, awe-inducing uh, to see that Made in China stamp over so many of our products that we consume today. But I think there's a, even if one is not a China threat kind of um, part of that crowd, I think for many Americans, there's something unsettling about this growth story, both this curve, which says something about rising power possibly, and this curve, which says something about a, a trade surplus with the United States. I think for many Americans, there's a view somehow that in this game of globalization, China's out competing us. That somehow or another, whether it's China's manipulation of exchange rates, whether it's China's um, lack of enforcement of intellectual property rights, whether it's something about state ownership in the Chinese economy, there's something about this story that says, first, that China is growing by doing it differently, by doing economics differently from the United States. And by differently, I mean basically pursuing mercantilism. The U.S. pursues open liberal markets. Chinese pursue mercantilism, economic policy f to, to achieve state ends. So that's the first source of discomfort, I think, for uh, Americans. And then the second source of discomfort for Americans is that China is not just uh, doing it differently and redefining how economics can happen, but even more directly, look, China is a, it's a socialist system. It's a, it's a state-owned system. It's doing things differently, and it's doing things at our expense. It's our jobs that are moving overseas. It's our technology that's moving overseas and being then redeployed against us. It's our competitiveness that's being lost, and China's um, is rising, and essentially because China is playing the game by its own rules and different rules from ours. Uh, I'll say even among people who in the United States were more favorably disposed toward China and don't necessarily view China as a threat, I think many Americans are uncomfortable by the intellectual puzzle that China poses. For most Americans, on, on all sides, really across the political spectrum, there are certain assumptions about the way politics and economics interact. There's, there's sort of liberal assumptions, 19th century liberal assumptions, which say somehow growth should be associated with democratization. It's not clear whether democratization follows growth or precedes growth, but somehow they should be related. Somehow growth should be associated with property rights. Somehow we should expect rule of law to be uh, related to growth in some fashion. Somehow we should expect the state to be clearly um, distinguished from civil society. There are just certain boundaries, analytically and intellectually, which tend to frame many of our views about economics. Most of those boundaries are, if not violated directly by China, many are violated directly by China in analytical terms, they're at least challenged by the Chinese model. So even for, for people who don't view China as a threat, it's, it's a puzzle. And interestingly, much of the, or at least some of the things written about China that are, that are to some degree um, admiring of the Chinese growth model, things written in the United States, ultimately come back with a kind of a normative critique, which say this story of growth, it's fine, it, many smart things have been done to achieve this, but it's ultimately fundamentally not sustainable. 
it's not sustainable unless there's some kind of political transformation, which will then facilitate more growth, or unless there's some kind of transition to rule of law, which will facilitate growth, or if there's, unless there's some kind of clarification of property rights, private property rights, which will allow this thing to grow. So that kind of liberal framing often comes into play in a kind of normative sense. Still, though, the underlying um, assumption is that China is growing. It's growing, at least in some sense, by doing something differently. It's mercantilistic in many respects. And it's mercantilistic in ways that the United States is not. And because of that, China is, for the most dire observers in the US, China is eating our lunch in the globalization game. Well, the interesting thing is, many Chinese feel, um, in fact, that China is um, not the one who's eating the lunch but instead the one whose lunch is being eaten. And the one whose lunch is being eaten, not because China has somehow um, gone down another path in terms of economic development or, re, or, or um, re-envisioned somehow how economic development can happen or somehow recreated mercantilism in a viable fashion, but instead China's lunch is being eaten because China has very aggressively tried to grasp a series of global institutions or modeled its own institutions on a, on a global model or a US model. In, in, in short, China is playing somebody else's game, particularly the US's game. And because of that, China has grown, but at the same time, a power in many respects has moved out of the hands of Chinese players. I'll leave it for you to decide which is the accurate um, interpretation of what's happened, but what I'd like to do is try to at least tell the story from that, well, it's not fair to say there's a single Chinese perspective, but from that Chinese perspective that says it's the U.S. who's doing the eating and, chi and China whose lunch really is being eaten, I'd like to tell that story a little bit and see whether it, it makes sense for you, the story really being that China's playing our game, playing the U.S. game economically to China's, to, to suiting China's interests, but also in very deep fundamental ways suiting America's interests. So just a very quickly, a little bit of a, an update. You know, back in uh, 2006 and 2007 and 2008, even as the American economy was growing, of course, the Chinese economy was growing at a much faster rate from a much lower starting point. When the US economy was um, really doing quite well, there, I think there were a series of uh, relatively alarmist views about China. And what's interesting is when the United States economy began to sink dramatically late last year, the assumption among many Americans was that even if China is not a threat, at least China is operating along a different enough model so that China should be able to pick up the slack in the global economy. And that China really, by continuing to grow, can become a larger market really for the United States and in turn stimulate the US economy. And what we've seen at least so far is not so much China standing up as sort of the new driver of the global economy as the US moves out, but instead China following right along the path of the United States in, um, in a sort of a, a downward and rather precipitous downward trend. So what are some of the anecdotal reports from China? Well, the Chinese media has reported that, what, roughly 5 million migrant workers are on the move, not to cities, which has been the story over the last 15 to 20 years, but from the cities back to the countryside as factories are being idled, particularly in southern China, in Guangdong province. We don't have concrete numbers about this. Uh, just yesterday in the um, papers, the head of, the, of Taiwan's business association in mainland China reported the closure of 750 Taiwanese-owned factories in Dongguan, a major uh, manufacturing center in Guangdong province. So large numbers of factor, factory closures and you know, real upheaval, in the, particularly in South China. Uh, the numbers for exports are out now from December of uh, last year, December of 2008. Exports are down just under 3% year on year in China, but that's in dollar terms. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll get to the dollar terms for imports, but exports are down. 2.8% uh, year on year. Exports account for 10% of China's GDP, but 30% of China's growth. So of course, as exports come down, um, there's a, there is an impact on China's overall growth figures. And again, that 2.8% figure is in uh, dollar terms. In renminbi terms, exports are down uh, roughly 9%. Imports are down 21.3%. 
in December year on year, in part that's due to declining petroleum uh, prices. So China's a big importer of crude. Uh, but it's also in large part, or significant part, due to the falling off of the importing of manufacturing inputs that are then uh, values added, and those are exported to the United States. Taiwan has experienced, uh, I believe, year on year in December, so December of 08, year on year, Taiwan's exports, and Taiwan's largest trade partner now on the export front is mainland China, Taiwan's exports were down 43% in December year on year. So you can see how this fits together in the East Asian political economy. And then again, moving down, we see in November industrial output growth was down in China. Also, of course, in November, the Chinese government announced uh, roughly $580 billion stimulus plan. But notice, it hasn't been particularly easy for the United States to mobilize its own stimulus plan with transparency and all the things we'd like to see. It hasn't been um, any easier for the Chinese government to mobilize, at least to this point, the evidence suggests it hasn't been any easier for the Chinese government to mobilize its own stimulus plan. So the point is that the Chinese economy is experiencing a shock today, and it's experiencing a shock that's very deeply tied to the U.S. economy. And then the question is, how did we get to this place? How did we get to this position where the Chinese economy is so deeply tied to the U.S. economy? And what really do those ties mean. Well, before I talk about those ties specifically, and we'll run through some of it, the issues surrounding supply chains, global supply chains, and we'll talk a little bit about currency and a little bit about energy, but before we talk about that, I'd like to take a little bit of a historical uh, detour, hist a historical interlude to give some sense of how these issues have been framed in China um, in the distant and not so distant past. So I want to talk very briefly about two periods. One, the early to mid-1990s. But before we talk about the early to mid-1990s, I want to talk about the late 19th century and early 20th century, because I think there are some um, uh, important similarities between the 1990s and changes that happened in the 90s that are playing out today, and a series of changes that happened in late 19th century, early 20th century China. At the end of the 19th century, as most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, China, um, broadly speaking, faced a series of challenges and a series of crises. There was um, internal dissent, unrest. There was um, spreading poverty. Growth had tailed off. Of course, there were very substantial pressures being applied from outside China. Pieces of China were being pulled off by foreign powers. Parts of China um, domestically, in some sense, were being occupied by foreign imperialistic powers. So China was in crisis. And that crisis, again, arguably culminated in 1895 with the defeat uh, of China in the Sino-Japanese, where the defeat to the, the Japanese and the removal of Korea and Taiwan from Chinese control. And I think that war, the Sino-Japanese War, represented the culmination of a series of intellectual developments, intellectual trends that were, were happening, um, really through the, 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 the second half of the 19th century. And I mention that because the way that Chinese intellectuals began to frame their country's problems in the late 19th century are very interesting. We see a few things in that framing. The first is that we see in some sense, this incredible sense of awe on the part of Chinese intellectuals, of awe regarding the West, broadly defined. And he, here, I'm of course, borrowing from one of my own teachers, the late and very um, great intellectual historian, Ben Schwartz, who um, described this kind of awe that Chinese intellectuals had with what they viewed as a, a sort of the Promethean power of the West. They saw, particularly the UK, secondarily the United States, they saw these countries somehow pulling together economic might, corporate might, corporate organizations, military might, um, rule of law, markets, individual freedom, but individual freedom and competition manifesting themselves not in disorder, not in chaos, but in vibrancy and dynamism and innovation and maybe most fundamentally, power, power for the state and power for society. And as these Chinese intellectuals looked out with awe and maybe uh, dismay to some extent at that sort of Promethean power of the West, 
I think they were increasingly forced to, to recognize what their own society was lacking, or at least what they felt their society was lacking. In some sense, they saw society, their own society, that was intellectually uh, focused on a, roughly speaking, a, a, an ideology, Confucianism, which was conservative, and if not backward looking, at least focused on dealing with limited resources and allocating those resources and maintaining stability um, and avoiding competition. In some sense, a, an ideology that assumed that resources are limited, but um, human lust and human greed are boundless. And therefore, you need to control competition and control greed and control the avaricious um, appetites, really, of individuals and also the appetites of state officials. And somehow, you need to maintain a kind of um, uh, maybe utopian, but at least a stable subsistence agricultural base and avoid innovation, avoid competition, avoid instability. So these intellectuals saw that and as they saw this Promethean power of the West, I think they came to understand that if one were to duplicate this Promethean power and one had to duplicate this Promethean power in order to ensure the survival of one's own society, one couldn't just borrow a series of tools, one couldn't just borrow a series of scientific techniques, one couldn't just borrow a series of commercial models or governmental models, governance models. One had to address and overturn and challenge the fundamental values of society. So of course in China in the early 20th century we saw there were a number of models that Chinese intellectuals and politicians uh, policymakers could experiment with, and we know what those experiments were. Of course, the great experiment or not so great experiment, depending on how you think of it, of socialism in mainland China played out over ensuing decades. I mentioned that, um, that, that period of crisis and the response in that period of crisis because I think it's relevant to a second kind of crisis which befell China really in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The response to that crisis was somewhat similar to the response in the 1890s, but under very different global circumstances. And some of the results then end up being different from what happened in the 19th and early 20th century. So let's shoot forward to the really late 1980s and early 1990s. For China in the 1980s, of course, there was a kind of a slow um, groping, um, a search for, not a search to replace socialism in the 1980s, but a search somehow to revive socialism, a, a search somehow to inject some kind of dynamism into a country that was um, really quite depressed economically and depressed socially after the, um, the, 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 the wildest period of Maoism ending in the Cultural Revolution and culminating with the death of Mao, of, of, of course. So as China searched for some kind of solution, some kind of way to, to revive socialism in the 1980s, the reality was that for most urban Chinese, for most citizens in urban China, life wasn't dramatically different in the 1980s from what it had been in the 70s and 60s. I and mean, even in my case, when I was living in China in 1988, 89, and 90, so I lived in a, in a university. I was teaching in a university. It was a, like most industry. It um, was state-owned. It, uh, its employees were housed by the state. Salaries were, were very low, but we received um, a bunch of material goods and compensation, but we had to get them from our employer, so we got our housing from our employer, and we got a bunch of non-wage benefits. Health care is all taken by, care of by employer. I, of course, could switch jobs. I could go home, do whatever I wanted, but my Chinese colleagues, they couldn't switch jobs. In fact, they were at that university because after they graduated from college, that job was allocated to them through the system of Fempei allocation. So they were told where to work. They would stay at that workplace for the rest of their lives. And that's the way things work. I mention that only to say that really throughout the 1980s for urban Chinese, the system was decidedly socialist. It was quite state dominant. Markets didn't determine how one lived, where one lived. Markets had very little impact on one's salary. Goods were available in the 1980s, but still price was not really the medium of the main medium of exchange throughout that period. Several um, critical events happened in really from the late 80s through the 90s. First, the Tiananmen crisis in 1989. We can debate how close the Chinese system was to collapsing in 1989, but um, certainly having witnessed the immediate aftermath of 89 and lived in China, 
in the period after. I would say that the system was very close to collapse in 89, and that many citizens who were quite loyal to the system had utterly lost faith. They'd lost faith in their um, government. They had lost faith in each other. It's a whole other story of the social dynamic during the 89 movement. They'd lost faith in each other, and they had lost faith really in the future. Um, it was a very depressing time in China, a sense really that uh, Chinese socialism, maybe not socialism broadly speak, but Chinese socialism was bankrupt. It was, was dead. And moreover, people in Chinese cities saw their counterparts in the countryside getting richer. And there was a sense among many people in the cities that things were happening, but it wasn't happening in the cities. And if anybody was getting rich in the cities, it was people who had connections. So there was a sense of injustice. So 89, d disastrous and de depressing. Second thing that happened, of course, in the early 90s, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The collapse of the Soviet Union, while the Soviets certainly weren't China's allies in the 1990s, there were still many people in China who, who, who knew that slogan of the Soviet Union of tomorrow, uh, the Soviet Union of today is the China of tomorrow. And even if people didn't believe that slogan anymore in the early 1990s, still the Soviet Union clearly had some kind of connection to China in terms of the basic political economic model which was governing the country, governing China at the time. And to see the Soviet Union collapse so quickly and to see the country lapse into disorder so quickly I think was very bracing to say the least for many Chinese intellectuals. I think about my friends actually, all of whom were on the streets in 89, most of whom were party members, all of whom were on the streets in 1989 protesting when the Soviet Union collapsed, interestingly, most of those friends of mine turned around and said, we were crazy to be protesting, that, that, that socialism is dead in China. At the same time, we can't risk overthrowing China, overthrowing, overthrowing the government, that somehow we're on the, we're on the cusp of major disorder. Something needs to be done to save this society. You've got a, a sense, really, of... Um, of, of a common view that the society was on the, on the verge of crisis and was somehow sick institutionally and sick spiritually. And then the third crisis, which hit a little bit later on, was the Asian financial crisis, which in some respects sent a signal to many Chinese intellectuals that a model of, not a signal that markets were bad or destructive or dangerous, but rather that a model in which um, state-favored entities large industrial producers are showered with loans from a banking system which dominates financial intermediation and which is fueled by household deposits. Somehow a system like that which is extracting money from the populace and pouring that money into a small number of producers who are politically favored but also quite inefficient, that that is not a viable or sustainable way to run an economy. Say so that was the third kind of intellectual shock that hit many Chinese policymakers and intellectuals by the 1990s. And what does that mean as we take it all together? Remember at this point also, the United States had emerged clearly as the dominant superpower, as the only superpower in the world. The Soviets were gone. So the United States was ascendant. This was a period, well, lived through, a period in which a kind of a sense of the power of markets was pervasive, whether you call it an ideology or an analytical position, is, is um, immaterial, but the American model and the American vision of markets and American power were so obviously dominant, if not for Americans, certainly for Chinese. And just as there was a kind of awe at the Promethean power, the dynamism of the West in the late 1800s, so too was there that kind of awe in China regarding the West broadly defined, and particularly the United States in the 90s. I mention all that to say that in that environment, in that intellectual environment, it's actually a, a very exciting period. I have to admit, I was living in Beijing in 1994 for part of 1995, and there ch changes were really happening, starting to happen in a very big way, and it was, um, it was quite exciting, actually, the sense that something was really changing. And things, it was the first time in my life I got the sense that things were about to happen that I never would have imagined possible just 
months or years earlier. In other words, I would have never imagined 1994 that I would see in 2004 the kind of picture of Shanghai that I showed you. But there was a sense somehow that that which had been politically and economically impossible just yesterday now might indeed be possible. What I mean by that is that by the mid-1990s, it became increasingly clear that Chinese policymakers, particularly the, 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 the person who would rise to the premiership by the late 1990s, Zhu Rongji, would undertake really to completely wipe out in many respects traditional socialism in, in China and replace socialist institutions with a series of outside institutions. Now in the 19th century, it was possible given the way economies were structured to model an economy um, on sort of an over, overseas example or overseas model. But as I'll talk about in a moment, by the 1990s, it wasn't simply the case that one would model one's own system on an exterior um, model. In other words, try to duplicate an external model. Instead, there's a very different kind of embrace and an, an enmeshing of different models. And by enmeshing those models, those doing it on the Chinese side, were effectively outsourcing the power to write economic rules to a series of outsiders in many cases, Americans, other global organizations, and in many sense, corporate actors uh, throughout the world. And what I'd like to do for a moment is uh, demonstrate a little bit what I mean by that kind of outsourcing, institutional outsourcing, and also demonstrate uh, briefly how this actually impacted Chinese society, how, how it really played out. So maybe we'll just go back very quickly to the slides. So in the 1990s, what we saw in the context of the collapse of the Soviet Union and that kind of a recognition on the part of key policymakers that socialism really was dead. The name would go, China would remain socialist, is socialist, but socialism, in fact, was recognized as dead. And traditional socialist institutions were eliminated in ways that I certainly would not have predicted at the time. I wrote a book in 1998 about um, reform of China's state sector. I would love to tell you that I completely uh, predicted the uh, dismantling of state industry, which happened really from 1998 to, um, into the early 2000s. I predicted the opposite, uh, I'm sorry to say. But the reality is, between 1994 and really 2001, so I, I didn't put that uh, up here, but between 1994 and 2001, about 70,000, mostly small to medium sized, but 70,000 state-owned enterprises disappeared. Simply disappeared. Some were privatized. Many were privatized, in fact. Some were listed on stock markets. Many were um, liquidated, simply disappeared. I would have never imagined that to be possible. Second thing that happened, and here uh, is the, the first bullet point. Second thing that happened was that for the relatively smaller number of state-owned firms that were left in place, labor lost its seat at the table. So you know, the numbers are a little hard to uh, pinpoint, but roughly 40 million urban workers lost their jobs in state-owned enterprises between 1998 and 2004. So many enterprises were eliminated. For the enterprises that remained, workers were eliminated in many cases. At the same time, that of course created incentives for policymakers in China to allow entry by non-state firms, private firms, maybe not as much as many of us would like, but still the private sector was legitimized, first in a de facto sense, but then second in a de jure sense, in part out of necessity with the downsizing of the state sector. Secondly, uh, China's agricultural economy or China's rural economy ceased to be agricultural and became industrialized. And as it became industrialized, rural citizens in some respects became deracinated. They were uprooted from a traditional rural lifestyle and they moved into industry. In many cases, they moved physically into Chinese cities. In some cases, they moved into small cities that were really just forming in the countryside. But people were on the move and are still on the move today. So in 2005, roughly 140 million persons were on the move, moving from the countryside to the cities. Numbers are similar in 2006. Of course, in early 2009 now, we see some um, reverse migration going on. At the same time that labor was downsized and this traditional notion that in, in a socialist compromise, people would be assigned jobs, they would stay in those jobs for their entire lives, um, they would be housed by those employers, their children would be employed by those employers. So that socialist compromise and that kind of social contract between citizens and the state, that was eliminated quickly 
in just a matter of a few years. And of course, to deal with that downsizing of the labor force and that unleashing of the labor force, a series of knock-on reforms had to happen. Housing markets had to be developed. People had to be given access to housing and the ability to buy housing. Labor markets had to be created or had to develop, and in fact did develop. Entry and exit for enterprises had to be developed. Labor law had to be developed. If workers weren't assigned to a job for life, there had to be some kind of contracting system between management and labor. There had to be some kind of health care system because health care in cities used to be provided by the state employer. When I was at a state university, if I got sick, did get sick, unfortunately, I ended up treated through the health care system of the university and then through the state system if necessary. That health care system in the, uh, at the, through the employer disappeared in China for the most part in the 1990s. I, I must say when I hear the problems, sad problems, of the American auto industry and hear the plight of American auto companies, their numbers of pension, pensioners, their um, cost structure on the labor front, their inability to fire workers, it sounds very much like what managers in Chinese state firms were telling me in the 19, early 1990s. And I must say that the comments of managers of Chinese state firms in the early 1990s justifying their bad economic performance, usually by saying we have too many workers or we're forced to pay our workers too much or actually we're sacrificing for the country um, or um, our health care costs are much higher than those of our competitors. Th those comments sound um, remarkably similar to what we hear from, from um, the auto industry and Chinese policymakers' response in the early 90s. We can't possibly um, allow these firms to go under because of all the effects on the rest of the economy also sounds similar to what we hear in the political space today. But interestingly, as I said, by the mid-1990s to late 1990s, Chinese policymakers were willing to pull the plug and did pull the plug in a very big way across various pieces of the economy. Th this is really worth noting. By the late 1990s and into the current decade, increasing numbers of Chinese citizens were living lives devoid of a safety net. They didn't have access to health care insurance. If they did have access to health care insurance, often that insurance required that people pay their health care costs up front and then they'd be reimbursed. So often people had uh, um, insurance arrears issues. There was a very little um, um, unemployment insurance, very little um, occupational safety insurance, really no safety net. And that continues today. So we've seen the plug pulled on that front. At this time, one of the, not the driver of this change, but certainly one of the major institutional transformations that was consistent with this change was China's accession to the WTO. And arguably one of the reasons why that accession was pushed by people like Zhu Rongji, the then premier in 1999, was as a sort of external whip pushing these kinds of changes in China's domestic economy. In other words, providing an external uh, standard or an external series of, of measures that would justify and, and underscore and um, force to some extent the continuation of this kind of pulling of the plug on socialism. This wasn't the only thing that happened, though, when we saw accession to WTO, which is one of the forms of institutional outsourcing that I'm referring to. The second thing that we saw happening, aside from the, the, the um, sort of reordering of the social contract in China and the, and the elimination of socialism in an economic sense in China, the second thing we saw was the um, enmeshment of China, particularly by the early, late 1990s and early 2000s, deep enmeshing of China in the global economy in terms of the, from, from production view. So the enmeshing of China in a series of global supply chains by the, whoops, what I really wanted was this. By the late 1990s, as you can see, China's shifting toward an export-oriented economy. So previously, imports and exports had moved pretty much in line. And then by the early 2000s and into 2002, 2003, China begins to run substantial trade surpluses. Now, what really is this story all about? And why, and what does it have to do with accession into WTO? beginning in 1999 and then formalizing really in 2001. Very interestingly, what we see is a pattern not entirely different from the United States, although a pattern that happened in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. By the mid, 
darn it, sorry about that. By the mid-1990s, this, what this curve shows you is employment in, in industry, really, here, employment in manufacturing, but employment in industry, broadly speaking, as a percentage of the Chinese workforce, so uh, not as, as, uh, in terms of uh, total numbers, the Chinese workforce, we see that employment in industry and employment in manufacturing rises through the 80s and into the early 1990s as the economy is slowly picking up steam. But then as the economy really starts to soar in the late 1990s and into the very early 2000s, employment in manufacturing, employment in industry tails off pretty dramatically. And it tails off for reasons not entirely different from why it tailed off in the United States. We saw a big upsurge in China during this period in employment and services, a variety of services. Uh, we saw a big uptick sorry, in employment in transport. And we saw a very big uptick during this period in employment in construction, because of the huge build out of Chinese cities and China's infrastructure during this period. But for all of the industry that was moving into China during this era, much of that industry was first place foreign owned, primarily overseas Chinese on Taiwanese owned, Hong Kong owned, but foreign owned. And second, much of that industry was a processing industry, so inputs were imported from particularly high-end imports were imported from outside, then there's a certain amount of value added through assembly and then exporting. So these are foreign-owned operations in many cases. And secondly, they're very tightly integrated into a series of global supply chains. Whether it's textiles or electronics, when assemblers are very tightly integrated into a series of global supply chains and ultimately linked to global markets in North America or Europe, they have to meet certain kinds of quality standards. They have to meet certain kinds of production time cycles. They have to be incredibly flexible. They have to be incredibly efficient. They have to be incredibly responsive to changing markets. And what does that mean? What it means is that during this period, many of the new factories that were being built and integrated into these global supply chains, they had to be built in a very capital intensive and technology intensive fashion. So the factories were certainly generating revenue and generating, um, generating growth and income and producing exports, but those factories were not generally generating jobs. In, for the same reasons American manufacturing really wasn't generating jobs. They were extremely productive, extremely efficient, but high productivity doesn't lead to um, job creation. It certainly didn't lead to job creation in this case, which of course creates a sense in China of um, a little bit of a sense for many um, workers especially, a sense, of, a strange sense really of hope on the one hand and a sense that in the future things will be better, but a little bit of a sense of where's our peace in this story? We see wealth all around us, but wh where's our peace? Where's, and, and, and it's not so different from how many American workers look at this. I will say there is one fundamental difference. Because as I said, China to some degree is on a collective societal mission to if not overtake the West. I don't think it's sort of overtaking the West, at least duplicate that kind of or achieve some semblance of that Promethean dynamism of the West. There's a sense among even some of the people who are suffering with these kinds of employment statistics, a sense of at least the country is catching up, or at least the country is modernizing and rising, which justifies a kind of societal pain in ways that similar pain can't be justified in the United States. Even though the pain is more intense in China, of course, much poorer country. That notion of societal mission is powerful in China and, and, and arguably, not even arguably, definitely much more powerful than in the United States. Just some additional uh, features of China's trading relationships that um, underscore what this enmeshment in the global economy means. If you look before really the economy started to, the American economy, North American economy started to turn down 2007 a little bit, 2008 for sure. If you look at the countries with which China was running bilateral trade surpluses, you have a predictable set of, um, set of options here. There's, a, well, maybe not so predictable, Hong Kong. If you look at, uh, this is from the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. If you look at the US Department of Commerce, uh, their numbers are different because they will classify many of these exports from mainland China to Hong Kong as exports ultimately to North America. So to some extent, you could take a large chunk of these exports to Hong Kong and include them in the trade surplus that China runs with the United States. But still, the story is one primarily of exports to North America, um, secondarily 
exports to um, the EU and a little bit really to Latin America. On the a story that most Americans are less familiar with, we look at China's major trade deficits. Now here you find, of course, the largest trade deficit is with Taiwan. So what does that mean? Well, it means that high-end electronics components, electronics mostly, are being exported from Taiwan to mainland China, where they're processed up. A small amount of value is added. And value often in Taiwanese-owned companies, so a piece of that uh, the profit from that value-adding activity is being repatriated to the owners rather than Chinese workers. But a substantial number of inputs come into these factories, assembly happens, and then export to the United States. That's why China's import, when China's imports dip, as they did last month, Taiwan's exports dip and dip even more dramatically. But Taiwan runs trade surpluses with China. Korea runs trade surpluses with China, Japan runs trade surpluses, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian countries, we'll get to Angola in a second, run trade surpluses with China. And then we have the energy story. So Angola, Saudi Arabia, major exporters of, of crude oil um, and some refined products to China. Well, what this story in part explains is why it is that many of China's neighbors don't exactly buy that story of China as a threat, necessarily, or China as um, a mercantilist power, or China as a country that's manipulating its economy um, to their own detriment. Maybe to North America's detriment, but not to their own detriment. These are major winners in the trading game with China. I won't go through this whole slide, and I'll be happy to leave these slides with you if you want to take a look at them. But this uh, takes that same story I just told, but brings it down to the level of the individual product. I mean, basically, well, this is a, an iPhone, but an iPod. And what this story says, or what this story tries to do, and this is a, some work by Lyndon Kramer and Dedrick, what they tried to do is they tried to pull apart, not literally, but figuratively, pull apart a, an iPod and figure out who's making the money. On this, where, where's the value in this made in China product? So, surprise, surprise, for this $300 product that's assembled in China, they find that, um, well, Apple's uh, margin off the top is, is pretty good. So, Apple is, is taking $80 off the top. So, you see the wholesale price is uh, $224. Um, so, the retailers are uh, making some money. Apple's making some money. You can see what Apple's input, co input costs are roughly. And of course, this is proprietary information trade secrets, so these researchers had to try to untangle this themselves. These are estimates. But Apple's getting a pretty good chunk, so they're pretty good returns to product definition and product design and marketing. Of the major input producers for the iPod, there's a relatively small amount of profit, a relatively small uh, 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 slice that those input producers can um, can capture, but notice where a lot of these inputs are coming from. So down here, you can, oh, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. You can see that you've got uh, the hard drive is made by Toshiba, done in China, so assembled in China. You have stuff coming in from Japan. You have pieces coming in from Taiwan, some of which come from Taiwan, some of are assembled in mainland by Taiwanese companies, CPU coming in from Taiwan, not done in mainland China. And then finally, the product is uh, assembled in China. Again, though, not by a Chinese assembler, but by a Taiwanese-owned Inventec. So what does this story say? Well, it's pretty obvious what this says. It says that in global supply chains, it's, um, it's a much better thing to be on the product definition side and on the branding side than it is really to be on the assembly side. But if you're in the assembly side, this is no easy, trivial game to play. And in fact, involves very sophisticated management, very difficult uh, challenges and tasks. And it's not exactly uh, coincidental that often you have highly specialized overseas owners who come in and run these factories in China itself. There, there's just one additional feature that um, I think is worth mentioning. I, I do a lot of interviewing at the enterprise level in China and talk to a lot of Chinese managers, some at foreign companies, some at Chinese companies. But when I talk to Chinese managers, in um, particularly in Chinese domestic uh, IT or electronics companies, when they talk about Apple, you get that same sense of awe at the Promethean power 
of this entity. And the reason why I say awe, oh, what they describe, when they describe Apple, is not a company that somehow is farther along on the curve that you know, the Chinese assemblers are uh, somehow doing low value activities and Apple is somehow farther along the curve and that uh, the Chinese have to somehow develop a bunch of uh, capabilities that will allow them to climb up the curve. Well, that may be one interpretation of the story. That's frequently not the interpretation that Chinese managers give to me. What they describe is a situation in which they see a company like Apple farther along the curve and the Chinese managers are trying to learn how to do it. How do you define a product? And how do, you just, how do you move up that curve? And as soon as they start figuring out how to move up that curve, Apple has redefined itself. And Apple's now a media company. And they're looking at iTunes. And Apple is a company that's an image company. It's a music company somehow. And now it's maybe a producer of content for iPods or iPhones. Or, oh, no, it's, it's not even a producer of content. Now it's a telecommunications company. Now, it's a, there's another story for why that is today and why the way that manufacturing happens today allows leaders in manufacturing to jump across industrial silos in ways that didn't tend to happen in the past. But for Chinese producers, for Chinese manufacturers, it is awesome and I think, if not awe-inspiring, intimidating to see global leaders like Apple and innovation leaders jumping from industry to industry, moving seamlessly across these boundaries in ways that really um, elude many Ch uh, 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 Chinese producers. I'll just skip over a few things and then, then we'll conclude. So just one final piece or uh, a point about this sense of, of um, how other people are not necessarily eating China's lunch, but why this kind of global integration is, while beneficial for China, stressful for many Chinese. I want to just mention a few points about innovation and how industrial innovation is understood or viewed by many Chinese. So first thing, in, um, from 1995 to 2005, now these are numbers from, these are official Chinese governmental numbers from a variety of different agencies, but in a, in a report that uh, one bureaucracy did in, in China, it's really the, the Ministry of, of Science Technology, most. Most did a study on R&D and industrial R&D in China. And what they found was that from 1995 to 2005, R&D funding was up very substantially on a you know, year by year. But somehow Chinese companies and Chinese individuals weren't accounting for a high number, a large percentage of international patent implications, uh, pa patent applications. The second point about uh, indigenous investment in, in, um, in R&D is less important than really the third point. So the Chinese Ministry of Science Technology tried to identify what at least it considered high-tech exports. Now, in reality, the things it identified as high-tech exports weren't that high-tech. There were things like uh, DVD players and um, digital cameras. So in many respects, commodified products. Nonetheless, they identified these products as high-tech exports. But what they found was that almost 90% of these high-tech exports, most of which were just being assembled in, in China, almost 90% of the exports were being booked by foreign invested firms, and in many cases, foreign wholly foreign-owned firms. So what this story again says is that innovation may not really be happening in Chinese industry. For indigenous companies, they're seeing the innovators overseas jumping from industry to industry, and they're seeing even the more advanced activities within China, of course, bringing wealth to China, bringing growth, but also really uh, redounding to the benefit of a series of outsiders. Now, one uh, last point before I uh, conclude, a, a point about energy. Now, energy, maybe we could talk about if you want in the Q&A, but energy is one sector where you, you really wouldn't expect this kind of interpenetration of foreign owners and foreign interests and whatever else to happen. Energy is a strategic industry. It's um, entry into the energy sector in China, certainly in oil and gas, is very limited. There are three oil and gas majors in China, all listed on global stock exchanges, but still the three oil and gas majors, all majority state-owned. But we do have an environment in which energy demand in China, at least until the last few months, has been rising very, very rapidly. You can see, I mean, this is just telling you total primary energy supply, but uh, 
you could see toward the later years of this curve, there's a very uh, steep slope. So energy demand is rising rapidly. We know this story about Chinese energy companies, oil and gas companies in particular, going out and signing deals globally. I think many of us assume that these companies, because they are state owned, are somehow agents of the state, that somehow they are an appendage of a, of a state and they are the um, sort of the um, action point at which state energy policy and state industrial policy meets global markets. The, the, maybe the quintessential moment in that view happened in the summer of spring, really, of 2005, when one of the three oil and gas majors in China, a state-owned company, um, the offshore oil company, CNOC, CNOC, tried to acquire uh, Unical, American oil and gas producer. Now, I should say I have no uh, financial tie with CNOC, but I sit on an advisory board for the company. I'm not a board member. I'm not a member of the board of directors, but I sit on an advisory board, which is only to say that I have, uh, I don't have the secrets to the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom, but I have some sense of what happens in that company. And what's so interesting, and what was so interesting in 2005, when that ostensible agent of the state, an appendage of state energy policy, made a bid for Unical, was at first that bid was financed not by the Chinese state, but was financed by Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, above board, you know, legally, transparently. So the financing for that deal was provided by the global investment banking community. The legal work for that deal was um, done by, I guess I can mention it's uh, available in SEC documents, uh, Davis Polk, Davis Polk Wardell, so a big global New York-based law firm, did the legal work for that. The deal was brought to the table um, by the investment banking community, not by the Chinese government. And maybe most important of all in this story, uh, there were differences of opinion within the company about whether this was the right move to make. And when efforts were made to get some kind of response from the center, from the central government in China to, to, to whether or not this deal should move forward, there was no response. There was no, there's no energy ministry in China. There was nobody to go to. And although various efforts were made among, by some people in the company, there was no real, uh, real entity to go to. And what we see here is a company involved in a strategic industry, but a company that's quite interpenetrated in what I think are healthy ways generally, but quite interpenetrated by um, global market forces and global market players, namely investment bankers, but not exclusively investment bankers, who then push the deals, bring the deals to the table, lobby both the Chinese government and the American government. And there was a lot of lobbying before that deal hit the press. And interestingly, lobbying not just of the governments, but some of these outside players end up um, resolving dissension within the ranks of management inside some of these companies. In some sense, it's an analog to that story of globalized supply chains in which outsiders are given truly privileged positions in the Chinese economy, in China's political economy. And let me just close by talking for two minutes about the, some of the political, really, and socio-political uh, ramifications of this particular um, definition in China of what modernization and what modernity is about, or you know, uh, definition in terms of grasping global economic institutions and, uh, in effect, playing the global and particularly the American economic game. So what, what kinds of political ramifications do we see from this? Well, first place, what we see is that the concept of rule of law, a rule-based system, well, that's, of course, an abstract concept. And we can define it in many ways, and we can differ about whether the United States is really rule-based or not rule-based. But that concept of fa zhi, rule-based, has become legitimized in China. And just as China has expressly embarked on this mission to duplicate or, or to try to capture the Promethean power of the West, Promethean power of the United States, Rule of law has been identified as a key piece of that story in the United States and has, to some extent, been transposed or moved over to China. Now, of course, we know that China is an authoritarian and deeply authoritarian system. And we know that there are aspects of this rule of law story which have not gone well in China. And there are aspects of it which have been completely trampled by the, by the Chinese state and various pieces of the Chinese state. But what's interesting is 
the notion of rule of law and the value of rule of law has been legitimized as a, as a, um, as a goal in society and as a topic for discussion. Once a concept is legitimized, particularly in a system which is increasingly interpenetrated by a series of players who are global players and in a system in which there are exit options economically for individuals, not just working in a state-owned workplace, then the legitimation of a kind of discourse about rule of law can become very interesting and can become very contentious and can become quite empowering for citizens. Second point related to the first the Chinese government, in part at the center, in part because it has legitimized the West and the United States as a kind of objective for China in terms of its own growth model, has increasingly in its own statements to Chinese citizenry, has increasingly taken concepts like the notion of achieving a middle class society and drilled into um, the Chinese kind of collective consciousness the legitimacy of these goals. So what is a middle class society mean? What does it mean to, 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 for the, when the central government a few years ago was really pushing this line that the center will deliver to Chinese citizens a xiao kang shou hui, the middle class society? What does that mean? I don't know what the hell that means. And in fact, the Chinese government at the center didn't really clearly specify what that meant, but that's interesting because that creates space for lots of different people in this highly globalized system to try to fill in the blank. So how is that blank filled in? Well, at various points, the central government included um, equitable distribution of income, decent environment, um, job security, uh, uh, innovation, an innovative society, a uh, competitive society, a, um, one in which there's equality of opportunity, one in which there's meritocracy. So all different kinds of pieces became um, legitimized to some extent, or at least became part of this story of middle class society. And what's interesting is that space provided lots of, or, or that space was answered by many things, but socialism was not really ever an answer that anybody was providing in, in that space of what middle class is all about. Third point, what we've seen in this context of lots of discussion of rule of law, lots of vague discussion of middle class society as opposed to socialist society, is we've seen lots of pluralization of information channels, not a free press, a state-dominated press is still the case, but a lot of pluralization and fragmentation of the, of the, of the media um, and localization in many cases of the media. So lots of different uh, views being expressed with censorship and with, uh, 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 in, in, the, in an authoritarian context. Fourth point, I think we've seen, interestingly, in part because the government has set out these various targets for a decent environment, decent uh, job security, competitiveness, um, equality of opportunity, meritocracy, which of course these are not all reconcilable features, and done that in the context of a system in which governance is quite um, uh, challenged in many respects and enforcement of rules is quite challenged. What the government has done has increasingly legitimized, ambivalently, but increasingly legitimized the concept and the reality of civil society. The idea being that, look, if the state can't deliver all these things, somebody is going to deliver them and presumably it's going to happen by civil society. And I say that in two respects. Increasingly in China, there's an attitude that what the state, what the public sector can't provide, um, health care, uh, a safety net, insurance in various forms. What the state can't provide, society should provide in, in almost a, a Reagan-esque kind of sense that big state is bad state. Well, in China, often it's incapable state, but big state is bad state. Private, private world, whether through charity or other mechanisms, will, will, provide, will provide those goods. And then there's a second sense in which civil society is used and legitimized. And that's the, in the sense that, yes, the government will provide these things. But you know these are complicated things to provide. And there's all sorts of, of agency problems. And really what you need is accountability. And where is accountability going to come from? Well, some of it will come top down. But a lot of it's got to come from civil society. That it's up to the citizen to monitor, to some extent, government, especially local government, not to monitor the center so much, and certainly not to form any alternative political parties or anything like that, but at least to monitor localities. Uh, last year, there was a, actually just two years ago now, there was a uh, delegation visiting from the Central Party School 
visiting Cambridge, but visiting uh, from the Central Party School, which is, of course, the main institution by which uh, officials uh, receive training, at least at the central level. So the Central Party School sent a delegation. They visited MIT. I actually knew a couple of the faculty who were on this delegation, but they came. It was a curriculum development trip, and they wanted, they wanted to develop curricula in two areas. One area was environmental management. It's all right. The Central Party School has gotten its directives. It has to develop courses on environmental management and environmental policy. Fine. The second area that they wanted to develop courses on was civil society and the role of civil society in good government. It was as if you took a, a, a page right out of the syllabus for an American political science you know, graduate seminar. How does civil society lead to effective governance? And in a democratic context is what they were essentially interested in. And the, 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 the group of people who were assigned to develop these curricula were um, huge enthusiasts of this notion of civil society as some kind of source for accountability. How that would ultimately be reconciled down the road with um, issues of democratization or liberalization, far be it from me, for me to say, and far be it for, um, for the people in that delegation to say, but they are the establishment, and the establishment for, I think, instrumental reasons as well as um, deeper reasons were interested in this um, issue. And just lastly, on this front, I would say that what we've seen in this kind of environment in which so many rules are outsourced and the definition of the game itself, the definition of modernity is outsourced to the West and especially to the United States, we've seen a real diversification of voices within the establishment. So forget outside the establishment, but there really is a diversity, there is a diversity of voices which operates in China today at the corporate level. There's a diversity of voices at the governmental level. There's a diversity of voices within academia. This is no utopia by any stretch of the imagination. This is no liberal democracy. But it's an increasingly diversified um, world of ideas in China, and one in which the bounds for what can be said have clearly moved outward. So there's some very interesting ideas that are debated. But it's also an environment in which the boundaries between the foreigner and the, you know, between the foreign and the domestic, between the Chinese citizen and the outsider, those boundaries have blurred in all kinds of ways that are very challenging for insiders and outsiders alike to understand. I think on the plus side, what we've seen is increasingly in China um, a, a, a kind of a trend that at least Kevin O'Brien at Berkeley uses the term rightful resistance. There's a sense among, or a trend among many Chinese, and especially people, the least powerful people in the system, to stand up and stand up against the system, not to challenge the center, not to challenge authoritarianism, and not to challenge the label socialism, and not to organize an alternative party, but to stand up and to do it rightfully in the sense of standing up on the basis of the Chinese central government's own claims to rule of law, or the central government's own claims to, uh, uh, to, to achieve a middle class society, to stand up and fight injustice, often local injustice, and frequently to stand up and do so with other citizens, so to do it in an organized fashion in civil society. It's, it's a, a risky thing to do, but still done increasingly, and, and also foreigners who happen to be interpenetrating the Chinese system. You know, to, to me, when I see this, I find it incredibly exhilarating frankly. And I, I think there's tremendous cause for optimism given the flexibility of this system and the adaptability of many citizens, forgetting the state, but the adaptability and flexibility of many of the, of the, the ch of much of the Chinese citizenry. At the same time, I have to admit to being somewhat, and not just sympathetic, but um, intimidated by the kind of challenge that China faces in the following respect. You know, we in the United States, feel the problems of deindustrialization and we feel the problems of flexible employment where many people are working a lot but they're not working under conditions of, of um, sort of guaranteed employment or reliable employment and we feel the pain of, of um, sort of the, the, the um, uh, rising inequality in China, or at least the sense that somehow well, the economy is growing but we're not getting ours. It's somebody else who's getting the return. So we feel all that pain, but we feel that pain in a society which is um, 
roughly on a per capita basis 30 times richer, depending on how you count, but on an order of 15 to 30 times richer than China is. We feel that pain in a society in which government, for all of our complaints, does a fairly good job in delivering public goods and ensuring and enforcing the rules that prevail. So we, we have all that pain but in a very different context from China. China has much of that pain, has induced much of that pain aggressively and consciously under conditions of poverty in many respects, but also under conditions of an expressed urge and a, a societal mission to try to duplicate this kind of Promethean strength of the West. In other words, it's somebody on the outside calling the shots. It's somebody on the outside defining the game. And just as Apple you know, defines this product, maybe assembled in China, defines this pro product, I think for many Chinese citizens, China's modernization path and its mission, and one which so many citizens take pride in, understandably, and you saw that in the Olympics and the events surrounding it, that modernization process and path has also been defined by outsiders. And when you get a societal modernization process defined by outsiders, of course, that creates tensions internally, and tensions, I think, which we should all be aware of, and if not sympathetic to, at least that we need to take account of as we think about how we as a society and country will continue to engage this entity as it progresses along its path to modernity. Thank you. Would you like me to feel my apologies for going on so long, but questions? Uh, my question to you is threefold with regard to China's role in the current financial crisis. So the first is um, in terms of to what degree you think China is affected by this crisis and what's going on. The second is what opportunities this presents in the short, medium term to China, like sitting on a lot of savings, such as buying up distressed debt and things like that. And third, what are the long-term implications in terms of uh, the balance of power politically or economically between the U.S. and China as a result of the long-term effects of this cri crisis? Those are excellent questions and ones that um, sort of by definition we really don't know the answers to, but I'll, I'll provide a little bit of, a, of an overview at least. So first thing, China is, uh, I think as we speak, being affected in a variety of ways, in ways that are a little bit, you know, maybe comparable to what we see in the United States. So what am I talking about? First thing we're seeing is a real estate bubble in China seems to be deflating, if not popping, rapidly. So in most of China's large cities today, we're, see we're seeing real estate markets really start to turn down. I don't think we have particularly good information for the experience for the degree of exposure that Chinese financial, inst financial institutions and organizations have to the Chinese real estate market, but suffice it to say, there is exposure. Second thing, with the downturn, with the financial crisis in the United States and the freezing up of credit in the United States, American consumption has tanked. And when American consumption tanks, in the way that the global economy functions today, there's almost no time lag Instantly, the Hong Kong-owned and Taiwanese-owned assemblers on the mainland, they idle themselves. They don't necessarily close down, and they don't necessarily go out of business. I can't mention the name of the company, but a very important Taiwanese-owned assembler for many of the products you all use and I use, uh, instantly, when the financial crisis really hit in the U.S. in November, they immediately cut production and immediately tried to move out inventories and stopped importing inputs. It was instantaneous how, how their business just dried up. So that's really the second and most um, important um, issue that when American, when North American consumption stops because of credit problems in the United States, um, production stops in China. And then there's a, a third piece of this story which is complicated uh, in a variety of ways. China really since the early part of this decade when it started to accumulate foreign reserves. 
China chose, for a number of reasons, to take those reserves and instead of encouraging investment in China's domestic economy, those reserves, those dollar-denominated reserves, those dollar-denominated assets were invested in the United States. So the Chinese government bought U.S. treasuries. There are a number of reasons for that. We don't need to talk about it but, uh, at length, but one reason is really two important reasons. First, this was part of an effort to liberalize the currency regime in China. Now, China doesn't have a fully liberalized currency regime, but what it was doing really from the mid-1990s through the present was moving off a system in which currency and exchange rates were dictated by fiat to one in which exchange rates were set, were managed, but managed through open market transactions. So how does the Chinese government manage the, the um, value of the renminbi versus the dollar? Well, when renminbi, when, when dollar, um, uh, uh, when dollars flow into China, what the Chinese government does is it purchases treasuries to keep up the demand for the dollar relative to the renminbi. One of the reasons it does this, of course, is arguably to support export-oriented industries. The second reason, and arguably the more important reason why it began to do this, was as a measure, a mechanism for controlling inflation in China. To some extent, back to the institutional outsourcing story, the Chinese government, by pegging or at least managing its own currency's value relative to the dollar has outsourced monetary policy to the United States. And by outsourcing monetary policy to the Fed, at least to this point, that was an effective mechanism for controlling inflation in China. What's happened, though, is that, of course, Chinese dollar-denominated assets have grown remarkably over the last five years. Now, those assets, as I mentioned, are held as U.S. Treasuries. Those assets correspond to a series of liabilities in the Chinese banking system. What am I talking about? Well, when those dollars came into China, they were dollars earned in many cases by Chinese producers, whether they're Chinese owned or not. And those assets, or th those uh, earnings, come into China, they're deposited in banks. So banks have real liabilities. They owe that money to Chinese citizens. That money has been invested, they owe that money in renminbi to Chinese citizens. That money has been invested in the United States in treasuries, so dollar-denominated assets. The Chinese system is vulnerable, therefore, to a major devaluation of the dollar. The last thing many people in China want to see, and certainly many people in the Chinese Central Bank want to see, is a real downward pitch of the dollar because these assets that the Chinese system owns, the U.S. Treasuries, will decline in value, but the liabilities, which are renminbi denominated, will remain high and will rise relative to the assets that correspond to those liabilities. So now, I mention all that to say the Chinese government, in a way that's somewhat complementary to the dilemmas the U.S. government faces, the Chinese government faces a dilemma. On the one hand, it wants to stimulate the economy in China and do so by stimulating domestic consumption. In order to do that, at least in part, it has to rechannel those financial flows. So all those savings that were being shifted over to U.S. Treasuries need to be shifted over into renminbi denominated investments, into infrastructure, and uh, whether it's physical infrastructure, public infrastructure, or um, institutional infrastructure like healthcare systems. The New York Times just a couple of days ago had a front page story that said something like um, app Chinese appetite for dollars you know, goes down, or Chinese appetite for treasuries goes down. Well, after all, that's what we've been encouraging the Chinese to do, to move out of the dollar and move back into the renminbi. Chinese uh, policymakers, to the extent I understand their preferences, are cautious about doing that. As I mentioned first, because they don't want to do this quickly and have any kind of uh, serious ramification for the value of the dollar. And second, just as in the United States, we've seen a lot of problems with this initial tranche of, of, of funding for the financial sector and problems of accountability and problems of transparency and problems of money disappearing and problems of money ending up as bonuses. We've, we've seen the full array of problems. In China, there has been experience like this in the past of, of comparable sorts of bailouts and concern about the contemporary situation in which big amounts of money are pushed into a system with very little accountability. And I think precisely because of that, the stimulus package that was announced um, seems to be at least to present more um, more on the announcement and less in the actual reality of investment pouring in in China.
So again, in those three ways, at least, there are big challenges that the Chinese system faces as it tries to respond to this financial crisis. And it's given the way governance happens in China and given really the, the incapacity of many pieces of the Chinese state to, um, to be accountable and to monitor themselves or, or um, to enforce policy, I think we should be somewhat uh, guarded in, um, in the degree to which we really expect the Chinese system somehow to, by stimulating consumer uh, by stimulating consumption, consumerism, somehow to replace or displace the U.S. consumer as a driver of the global economy. We're struggling to cope with our financial crisis. I think the Chinese are struggling even more and have fewer instruments at their tools at their disposal to deal with that crisis. Uh, yeah, Martin. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, political implications of the slowdown in economic growth. Yeah. And uh, we all know that in China there's this obsession with the minimum level of growth, which is supposed to be 8%. So could you talk briefly about the potential implications of growth slowing down below 8% yeah. in a year when we have a 20th anniversary of Tiananmen and the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese, um, of the People's Republic of China. The other time when growth slowed down to less than 8% was 8990, and we know what happened then. So is 2009 different from 89 yeah. and how so? So this is a, a great, question. But let me mention one thing about that notion. You see it in the newspaper all the time about uh, some of this 8% figure that if China has to maintain 8% growth or else society is really going to come unglued. And really the argument's more sophisticated than that. The argument says um, given the way that demography works in China, the um, growth rate of the employable population is at a given rate, and 8% growth is necessary in order to absorb all of, these, all of these new workers and workers shifting over from agriculture to industry. So th there's a certain rationale. Nonetheless, th this um, sort of 8% concept has been sort of reified, you know, something concrete all of a sudden that it, you absolutely can't go below 8%. Now, I don't think this is just a Chinese notion. There's something about the sociology of information. Somebody came up with this number. I don't know. It would be worth looking at who came up with this number, but it's bounced around. American analysts use it. European analysts use it. Chinese analysts use it, this 8% figure. Um, I don't know why there's anything particularly uh, true about that 8% figure. I mean, after all, I'm not exactly sure why it is that uh, Chinese citizens will, will respond positively if the rates are above 8% or won't po respond positively if they're below 8%. So be, be cautious and skeptical about these numbers that are taken as sort of um, fact, as a, as a determinant of social order in China. But, but on the more important side of the question about the comparison between 89 and 2009, so as I said, I, I was living in China during a part of the run-up to Tiananmen and certainly the immediate aftermath and the year plus afterward. In the run-up and in the year after, uh, there was a, at least I think, again, I'm speaking very impressionistically, so take it with the appropriate grain or bushel of salt. But in the late 1980s in China, there was a deep, among many urban citizens, and certainly among the more educated urban citizens that uh, I was living with. And when I say anger, it wasn't anger necessarily with the economic situation. The economy was growing, but there was a, a, a sense of injustice that somehow, um, yes, there was change happening in the countryside, and I can remember going with friends of mine to the countryside, which at that time was very close to the city. There, were no, there was no suburban development, so you could get out to the countryside very quickly, at least in Nanjing when I was living there. And we'd go out and we'd see these homes that peasants were building, which were not exactly beautiful, but for my urban colleagues, incredible that these peasants could have a home and, a, and their own dwelling. For, for many urban citizens, there was a sense of of change passing them by, that somehow, yeah, maybe change was happening, but it wasn't happening in urban China. And worse than that, that there was unfairness. Somehow, insiders were, 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 were getting rich at the expense of everybody else. There was no sense among many of my friends in 1989 that tomorrow was going to be better than today. And there was no sense that among many of my friends at the time, colleagues, that their children were going to be better off 
um, than they were. And I think most importantly and least tangibly, there was no sense that the trajectory that China was on in 1988, 1989, meant anything for the identity of the citizens who I was dealing with. It really was a rather bleak period, and especially after the crackdown. In 2009, or let's talk about before the real downturn, 2007, 2008, you saw it a bit with a lot with the Olympics in Beijing. As I said, during the growth phase, the rapid growth phase that China's been in really over the last decade, there are a lot of people who haven't been winning in this story. As you know, as many of us know, there are a lot of workers who haven't been winning. There are a lot of uh, people in the countryside who haven't been winning. But the strange thing is, and a number of researchers who really look at this um, in a more sophisticated fashion than I do, and I'm just speaking impressionistically, when I, over the last decade, have talked to and frequently talked to the losers in this story, workers, workers who've lost their jobs, many of them will explain that loss not in terms of an injustice that's been committed to them, that's been uh, committed against them, but in terms of their own failings. So they'll say things like, and Mark Blecker is a scholar, um, a political scientist has written about this, but, but I've certainly observed it. People will say things like, well, China's getting on the global track. And you know, you, you can't have a job in the steel sector anymore. That's not the global track. Or I'm a worker, I don't have any skills in IT, and so I, you know, that's not, I, I need to retool, or I'll, I'll have to figure out some way. There may be some anger, but it's a lot of self blame and justification in ways that anger me, actually, justification for the plight that they're in, but a sense that China's getting on the track, and we may not, as individuals, be on that track, but our kids are going to be better off. And it, repeatedly, I'd hear that kind of justification of what's going on. And what I mean by that, or what I think the, the, the punchline to that is, is to say that this modernization path that China set itself on really after 89, and well into the 90s, I think for many people, and for many Chinese, resolved not just, or began to resolve not just an economic issue, not just a financial issue, but began to resolve an identity issue. Began to resolve, without getting too, too psychological, I think, began to resolve a status issue. And China getting on the track globally, even if it's somebody else's track and somebody else's definition for what that track was, I think had value for Chinese citizens. So yes, with a downturn today, of course, that induces all kinds of social tension. How could it not when factories are closing down and jobs are being lost? But I think the tensions or the stresses that are being induced today, very dire stresses in many cases, maybe worse stresses than in urban areas than in 89 where there was a safety net for many citizens, a crummy safety net, but a safety net nonetheless. Those stresses are being induced in a situation in which I think many Chinese citizens, whether we agree with this or not, separate issue, in which many Chinese citizens have bought into the current social contract and get some kind of value from that social contract, whether it's you know, expressed in the Olympics or other kinds of, of, of venues. So what does that mean? It means that, um, yes, there's a lot of tension in China. Yes, economic downturns are undesirable to um, political leaders in any kind of system, democratic, authoritarian, nobody likes this kind of situation. But I think that that point about a kind of a social contract that, and, and almost a legitimacy of this system that has value today, and a legitimacy I think that was absent in 89, says that this system may prove much more flexible than many people think. I don't admire the politics of this system, and I don't necessarily agree with some of my Chinese counterparts who, who um, may accept the legitimacy of their system, but I think they accept it in ways that they didn't 20 years ago. And what that means is that 8% figure might prove to be very mushy, and that this system may prove much more, um, 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 I don't know, innovative socially and responsive socially than many of us would guess. And we saw an indicator of that, actually, in 1997 into 1998, when many of us had similar concerns, Asian financial crisis, markets drying up, Chinese growth now didn't, didn't you know, completely tail off, but growth tailed off. And what happened? Big shocks were induced institutionally, big downsizing, big unemployment. The system didn't collapse. It redefined itself in, in mostly positive ways, although not exclusively positive ways. Let me suggest uh, just yeah. take one last question. So yeah. Can, yeah, it's terrific. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, you know, you've defined um, 
sort of contemporary China is defining itself externally, you know, following external models. And I wanted to ask, you know, to what extent was that a byproduct also of the Cultural Revolution uh, and the depredations, you know, that that brought? But my question is, uh, if things go south, if they go in the wrong direction, or as things progress, uh, can you foresee a resurgence of sort of a, a Chinese path to capitalism or a, a, a Chinese element to this? Because it sounds as if it's you know sort of artificial in a way. You know, we're going to just capture this yeah. and bring it in. But where does the Chinese element you know come into it? Where does the long culture, the long history of China, influence uh, this development. And that's a, um, it's a, a fascinating question for a lot of reasons. Until recently, really until the last few months, for many analysts of China, there was the, the framing was such that the analyst assumed that economic development, the political economy of development, was an understood entity understood in, in the abstract, we understand what happens in the United States, we understand the basics, and then there's a question of, of, of sort of understanding China or judging China on the extent to which it has or has not uh, um, duplicated these understood paths to, to, to modernities. And what I mean by that is, look, we all knew that you need markets for development, we all knew you needed financial liberalization for development, we all knew you needed deregulation in many respects, and we debated a little bit in the United States, but for the most part, we had an answer for development, and China seemed to be a little bit off that path, and we debated what, what really that meant. Today, we've been thrown back on our own heels, terrible economically, but very interesting intellectually, that all of these ideas that seemed so powerful before, and all the ideas that didn't seem so powerful before, like Keynesianism, all of a sudden have reappeared. And the entire framing of the economic assumptions you know, how the world works, not how China works, but how the world works, that framing has changed in the American um, political landscape and social landscape just in the last few months. So the question then is, what about China? China has in large part latched itself, um, in some cases physically, but intellectually and in policy terms, institutionally, latched itself to a model that is now under question, and, and so will China decide to go its own path? Will it, um, will it uh, somehow come up with a new set of, of definitions? I, I'm, um, I'm doubtful that China is going to, to um, go off in its own path, and the, the reason why I say that is this. Undoubtedly in China, for many Chinese, and there's a vibrant debate in China about um, economics and a vibrant debate about how much one needs to, or not, one needs to or shouldn't duplicate external models, but be that as it may, I think that for all of the emphasis in China on whatever with Chinese characteristics or you know, with everything that has Chinese characteristics, markets with Chinese characteristics, socialism with Chinese characteristics, Olympics with Chinese characteristics, whatever it is, rule of law with Chinese characteristics, for all that emphasis on somehow um, the uniqueness of China, and with, for all that emphasis on trying to attach a thread to um, something in China's own background to express the uniqueness of what China's doing, I think the reality on the ground for the most part is um, duplication, or if not duplication, some kind of um, grappling with the external model. Now, of course, as any system grapples with an external model, it's gonna change that model. And so almost by definition, China is going to be different. But I think the extent to which, at least on the economic front, China tries to be different is very limited today. And I, I think maybe one of the punchlines you can decide for this talk is even if there are constituencies in China, and there are some in the intellectual sphere, in the commercial sphere, who do want to see China go a different path, whether it's on the environment or whether it's on commercial innovation or whether it's on politics, even if you have some small constituencies that want to see the the, the, the alternative path taken, it's increasingly difficult, at least economically, to take that alternative path precisely because the current path is so linked into a series of actors who are external to China. In other words, the people who have a say, really, in where China's gonna go are not just in China anymore. In the past, lots of people, um, as models had a say in where China was going to go. So 
socialist Marxists had a say externally, the Soviets had a say, the Americans had a say, the Brits had a say, but they had a say as, as models on the horizon. Today, it's not about models on the horizon, it's about players deeply enmeshed in these, in these political economic systems. So I think the degree, unless there's really a complete collapse of the global order in a, in a way that would be catastrophic, and which of course I hope doesn't happen, short of a complete collapse of the global order on par with what happened in the 1930s, um, I don't see China in real terms um, and in serious terms redefining the institutional path to modernity. Thank you. Hey, uh, let me just say, um, I learned a tremendous amount of talk. That was really just a first-rate presentation, incredibly stimulating. Um, I'd like to remind the audience very quickly that um, next week, I believe it's exactly a week from today, we have Min Jin Pei from the Carnegie Endowment, who's also going to talk about reforms going on in China, focusing more on, on political reforms. Actually, but, he's um, great, and his views are definitely different from what you heard today. He's a, a classmate of my friend. So it's great. You're going to hear a very different story. I Two endorsements. But, but most important right now is please, please join me in um, thanking, giving great gratitude for this terrific presentation by Ed Steinfeld.